why I'm screening these talks possible. Yeah. So with that, I want to introduce Dr. Nora Sarman. Nora's been with us at USU for about two years, I think, now, Nora? A year and a bit. Okay, a year and a bit? Yeah, okay. Uh, and, and Dr. Sarman is an assistant professor with appointments both in the Department of Biology and the USU Ecology Center. Uh, Nora is a California native, specifically the Bay Area, and even more specifically, Marin County. And uh, starting with her undergraduate work, Nora uh, attended the University of California at Berkeley, where she studied conservation genetics. Let me make sure I have this right, though. I know conservation genetics is in there. So conservation and resource studies at the University of California at Berkeley. As an undergraduate, Nora became keenly interested in conservation genetics, and she did a project on seahorse conservation, and specifically the giant Pacific seahorse. And I'm not sure how big that is, but I don't know. Giant horse seahorse. Giant horse. One of the really big ones, okay. which needs to be conserved, because Nora has said that it is used in Chinese traditional medicines, and that, that puts a lot of pressure on many species. Nora continued that work in her, in her first uh, full-time position as a scientist at the California Academy of Sciences, where she continued work in seahorse conservation. She then went on to start work for a PhD at the University of California, Santa Cruz, again in evolutionary genetics with an interest in conservation, where she extended again her theme in marine work, looking at uh, marine mussels, and, and looking at conservation of those, but important for this talk, okay, Nora started applying big data methods, genomics uh, and spatial data married together to try to understand conservation biology issues and ways to conserve species. Uh, as a postdoctoral fellow, Nora switched coasts and went to Yale University, where she switched systems as well and began working in of mosquitoes as disease vectors, and that's some of the work Nora will speak about tonight. Uh, Nora has told me that she never views herself as an academic, and perhaps still doesn't now, okay? but you are. <laughs> and uh, what Nora said is that curiosity has really led her through everything she's done, and including a lot of the really high-end tools in genetics, bioinformatics, uh, geospatial data that you'll hear about tonight, and her advice for young people in the audience is to follow your interests and curiosity, no matter how circuitous that path, and uh, it'll take you some really interesting places. So with that, Nora, please. Thank you. Thank you. Is that coming out clear? Should is it clear right now? Yes, it yeah. is. Okay. Yep. Your volume is good. Okay. So today I'm going to bring you on a journey on how we can use the great and small, what I'm considering the great and the small. So the great are images from satellites orbiting Earth, and the small is the DNA that is in every cell of your body and in every cell of a mosquito. And how we can use these two things to understand, understand mosquitoes and stop the spread of disease. So many of the world's worst diseases originated in animals in the wild. And then we're still over into humans. Mosquitoes are the masters at transmitting diseases between animals and humans, and then from human to human. Examples of these, type of these diseases are malaria, which infects around 220 million people a year and dengue, the dengue virus, which infects between 100 and 400 million year, uh, people a year. So these are affecting over half of the, the human population in the world. So I want to talk to you today about using the great, so those satellite images, and the small, the DNA, which is a molecule in every cell of a mosquito's body. Um, to build a window into the lives of mosquitoes. To understand where do they live, how far and where do they move, and how to use this information to 
prevent disease. Mosquitoes transmit diseases through biting mammals. So without mosquitoes around biting mammals, diseases like malaria and dengue fever would not be spread. The way this works is that if a mosquito, oh, I'm sorry, there we go. If a mosquito um, bites a human that has a virus, that mosquito actually gets infected with the virus, it gets sick. Often the immune system of the mosquito will fight off that virus and sometimes it won't. If it doesn't, then that mosquito can bite another person and transmit the disease that way. So why do mosquitoes bite? The basic needs of a mosquito are actually not that far off of the basic needs of a, of a person. They include food, shelter, family. So you might think, okay, for food, mosquitoes are really just considering which body part could bite, right? So they just, that's what you might think of. Um, but in fact, the mosquito food pyramid is more complex. And the reason for that is that different stages of the, the mosquito's life history require different nutrition. So as a little baby mosquito, there are larvae and they live in water. So they live in little pools of water in buckets in your backyard or in tire, old tires in an old junkyard or even in little pools of water in the forest. Um, and in these environments, what they're looking for is algae. They need carbohydrates to build their bodies and go through their different stages. Then as adults, they actually eat flowers, they eat nectar. So both male and female mosquitoes get sugars to survive um, from nectar. And the only time that they use, that they need blood is actually only the females when they need to um, gather enough energy to make these little eggs that they're gonna lay for the next generation. So they need those proteins and oils to lay their eggs. What else does a mosquito need? Uh, for shelter and family, they also need a place to live and breathe. So in the forest, that would look like a little puddle of water under a tree, potentially. But in a, a city or human habitat, that would look like a tire um, lying on the side of the road or in a, at a dump yard, um, and, or maybe a bucket of water in your garden, or even an old bird bath, or the, the little clay pot underneath your plant in, the, in your yard. So how do mosquitoes find food and habitat? When you zoom in on the face of a mosquito, what you see is that there are these little structures on their faces that are, there's antenna and there's hairs, and those hairs actually have uh, taste receptors on them. And they have, they have these hairs on their feet as well. So they can sense their environment with those taste receptors. They're sensitive to different animals. They can smell humans versus guinea pigs versus mice, um, birds. And they can also smell different attributes of the water that they're going to lay their eggs in. So they can kind of feel, oh, is this a good habitat for my eggs? Um, they can, smell bacteria, they can, they can taste or smell the kind of a similar, um, those receptors are acting in a similar way to your taste buds. So here I was going to ask for a volunteer to see if you guys, one person in the audience can spot what are the differences between these two different mosquitoes as a way of demonstrating to you guys how, how uh, how much variety there is in mosquitoes. So anyone want to volunteer what the differences are between these two photos? Go ahead. Yeah. One, one spotted. One spotted. One has those white spots on it, like little kind of scales, white scales, top one. Yeah. One is brown. One is brown. They're different colors. Anything about where they are sitting? Or oh, you have one more? 
Yeah. Yeah, the one on the top is sucking blood from a human. And the one on the bottom is on a bird, on a bird's back. So what that indicates is that the top one actually likes to, to suck blood from humans, whereas the bottom one prefers birds. It's there are some mosquitoes that like birds, some mosquitoes like specific small mammals, and um, there are some mosquitoes that really like humans. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus in on this one kind of mosquito that really likes humans. It's called Aedes aegypti, or the yellow fever mosquito. The yellow fever mosquito is an invasive species that lives across the world, and it's actually a day biter. It, it um, is most active during daylight hours, and it can get people, bite people, mostly when they're like moving from their house to their car to go to work or getting on public transportation or um, just get becoming active in, during the daylight hours. So that's what it specializes, how it specializes. So you might not think of cities as a place where mosquitoes bite, but that's actually um, where this type of mosquito lives mostly. In their native range in Africa, the yellow fever mosquito is found in both forests and cities. Um, these habitats are pretty different though, right? So in the forest, a mosquito can find habitat to breed in in tree holes or puddles, but in the, in the city, they're not gonna find those tree holes and puddles um, and natural little um, like pools of water. They're gonna need to find that, that shelter and plate breeding site in other ways. And so they go for trash, um, tires, buckets of water, water tanks, things like that. Where do they find food? In the forest, they would find uh, little small wild animals, wild mammals. But in the, the, the city, their best bet's probably gonna be humans. Sometimes some other things are, are, are good, um, good bets, like rats are usually a good bet in the city too, but the primary source of uh, food for Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito, for the females when they're looking for that blood meal so that they can lay their eggs is humans. Okay, so in general, the yellow fever mosquito in forests actually look a little bit different. So in Africa, where you find both of these forms, of the same, they're both the same species, but there's two different forms of them. Some of them live in the forest, some of them live in the cities. And the ones that live in the forest are these, this black color, and the ones that, that live in the city are a little bit more brown, a little yellower and brown. So they have different colors. And one of the scientists um, working on mosquitoes wanted to, she had this question, have these city mosquitoes adapted specifically to live with humans? So she had a hypothesis that she wanted to test. Um, and the hypothesis, oh, and this is uh, Lindy McBride, is her name. Um, and the hypothesis in this case, so it's an idea or an explanation that you want to test through study and experimentation. So the hypothesis that she had is city mosquitoes Maybe they prefer and can figure out and just choose to bite humans over other animals. So the way that she went about that is she set up this experiment to see if this hypothesis was correct. So she asked, she set up this experiment that allowed her to figure out if when given a choice, do they prefer to bite humans over guinea pigs? If these are city mosquitoes, they have that yellower color do they actually prefer humans? So she set up this experiment where she put mosquitoes in cages, and then she put a, a guinea pig on one side of the cage, and she put a human hand on the other side of the cage. And remember that mosquitoes have those little hairs and those taste receptors, so they can actually tell, they can smell things in the air that you and I can't smell. So they can tell, you know, oh, that's, that's a mammal over there on that side of the cage. And then she, her question is, can they actually tell, oh, that's a human hand that I'm 
going to prefer to bite if I'm from the city, and that's a guinea pig that I'm going to prefer to bite if I'm from the forest. So this is the result from her study. Um, so if we have that preference index, um, from left to right, each bar represents results from one cage of mosquitoes. The negative numbers mean that the cage tended to choose the guinea pig to bite, and the positive numbers mean that the cage tended to choose the hand to bite. So again, I'm gonna just ask for volunteers. Um, do you think that this result supports the hypothesis yeah. No. You don't. Okay. What? Give me a little bit of um, uh, insight into your thinking. What? Are, what are you seeing here? Uh, the guinea, uh, the guinea uh, pig bars are um, more. Uh huh. So that means uh, more uh, uh, mosquitoes want to bite them, and the on the hand they're like. Tiny. They're small. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Um, so, the forest mosquitoes are those black bars going to the left, right? And they're really long. So those forest mosquitoes really <coughs> prefer guinea pig. They always chose guinea pigs over the human hand. But, the, the truth is that um, for the city mosquitoes, even though it's a shorter bar in the positive way, positive direction towards the hand, they're still always that direction. So, what these little bar, with these little stars at the bottom of the screen, I, mean, I don't actually have a pointer, but these little stars at the bottom of the screen mean that when they combine all the results, those are significantly different. So even though that the the direct the uh, mosquitoes from the city didn't really like the human hand that much more than they liked the, the guinea pig, they still liked it more. And then those little stars at the bottom mean that it was a significant difference. So she used that to say. It supports my hypothesis because there's a big difference in the, the forest and the, the city mosquitoes. Does that make sense? Okay. So once these mosquitoes had adapted to live near humans and live in their trash or breed in their trash and their water buckets um, and find and, and have this adaptation to find humans to bite, um, they were all they they were poised in a way to colonize the world as stowaways on, on trade vessels. So they um, it we figured out through actually DNA studies, we use DNA studies to figure out that these mosquitoes moved with humans throughout the world in the 1600s. So they went from Africa to the Americas, the Americas to Europe, Europe to Asia. And now they live throughout the whole world in cities wherever it's warm enough for them to survive the winter. They, since their arrival in the Americas, they've um, had some new challenges. So they had to find, they have been, been um, challenged with new habitat, new environment, new human impacts. We know that human history has uh, brought on a lot of change in the last 400 years or so. There's been a lot of urbanization. There have been so many things that these mosquitoes have to adapt to. They have to figure out how to find all of those resources that they need. And they also have had to deal with things like insecticides that people spray out to kill either adults or, or larvae um, to minimize their population numbers. So they have all these things that they have to worry about. But I, I want to talk to you a little bit about something that we don't always as often think about, which are something I'm just kind of put together as uh, landscape effects. And this includes things like you know, temp temperature differences, rain differences across uh, Florida from north to south, um, where, what kind of forest cover or barren lands are there, um, altitude, and these differences in the environment alongside evolutionary chain forces such as uh, mutation and genetic drift, um, and limited movement 
of my great of, of these mosquitoes. So they don't can't move in as far as you know, they can't move that far in their lifetime. So they have limited, they're kind of limited to their little region that they were born in. And all these things together create differences between mosquitoes that live in different regions of the US or different regions of Florida, for example. So here I'm going to try to get a little bit of audience participation to better explain what I mean by landscape effects. Um, so I have here um, some candy and I have at least one volunteer to help me. And then
so that we would get a little more mixing over here, and that the third bucket up here would only have a little bit of mixing, but mostly Sour Patch kid, uh, Kids. Is that correct? <laughs> okay, so any ideas from the audience about why I expected this that bucket up there to be a little less mixed? What's that? Not really accessible. It's a little hard to get to. Yeah, not accessible even for the volunteers. Yeah, so there's there's a little um, there's a little bit of accessibility issue up there, right? So a few more steps. There's some yeah. Do you have another idea? You can, you can finish. Okay, so so there's a there's a rail and there's you know maybe a little bit of obstacles and it's a little bit further apart and so on in um, this analogy you might expect that there would be less mixing between this more distant these more distant sites. I just thought the analogy would be there if it wouldn't make logical sense or just be there. Yeah, so it's um, it's kind of a lot of effort to get over here from there, right? So that's, that's the that's the take home message. So why don't you guys take several candies? <laughs> you can take a variety, however, whatever you'd like, and um, I'll I'll talk about how this applies to mosquitoes. Okay, so these different kinds of candy were different were analogies for different populations of mosquitoes. Um, and when you're looking at a bunch of mosquitoes in Florida, you aren't necessarily going to be able to tell them apart very well. So that's where the DNA part comes in. So in my work, I use DNA to figure out what are those, to mark those differences between mosquitoes that are invisible to our eyes. So you might have you know, several locations in Florida that have a lot more mixing because they're close together, there's easier access, there aren't barriers, or there's not very much effort for the mosquito to move between those two sites. Whereas someplace a little further off, or across a road, or across a parking lot that's dry and hard to move across for a mosquito, there might be um, less mixing. So these are all one color. Um, and the way that I am able to distinguish those nuanced differences between mosquitoes is by looking at their DNA. Um, and so we score tiny differences in the DNA between them by putting those each mosquito in a tube and mushing it up and extracting its DNA and then scoring it with a SNP chip or some other technologies like sequencing. To actually get at the differences between these mosquitoes and the, between these populations of mosquitoes. So in the end, we are able to get something like this that shows um, different colors are representing different DNA and shows some variation across the landscape. So uh, closer mosquitoes are going to be a little more similar, right, than the further apart mosquitoes. The next thing that I do is I use uh, this map of DNA similarity and I compare that to satellite images that we can use to understand the landscape at a really detailed level. And we compare the DNA map to the landscape. So satellites are orbiting Earth as we speak, taking images every second of across the world. And with all of these images, with different filters and all these, these technologies that allow us to pick apart those images, we can actually get out of it some really complex information, like the temperature or the heat um, and how that varies across the landscape, or human density, or altitude. 
And we then can use this information and crunch the numbers with like a machine learning algorithm to compare the DNA similarity map to the heat, human density, altitude, and everything else that we can measure from satellite images. And from that, we can actually create a filled in map of the best guess of DNA similarity and differences across something like, you know, a huge space of the United States, like this southern, this, um, southern United States map that shows the similarity from yellow being very similar to purple being very different across that map, that range. We can interpret this by saying that the similar DNA in a region, so like in Florida, there's a lot of yellow, right? That yellow, all those yellow spaces in the map are showing that there's fast movement. There's a lot of mixing in the, between those regions. So we can think of this as sort of a heat map of movement of mosquitoes from fast to slow. Another thing we can, we can get out of this algorithm is that um, we can see what landscape images best match that original map of DNA similarity. Um, so we can kind of rank those different uh, landscape features like heat, slope, barren land, human density, green space are all really important if we're ranking them from most important to least important in the way that we use those to fill in the map of mosquito movement. And I want a volunteer again to just kind of help me uh, think through what might be important about temperature or heat and slope and barren land and human density for a mosquito? Why might these be important things for a mosquito in terms of where they can move and the least effort for them to move from one place to another? Yeah? Florida is hot and it has a lot of people. So the transmission must be low, so maybe that's why all the human mosquitoes are killing people that they're like at the end part of Florida. Yeah, so they're really warm. Florida is a warm, a warm area, and it's really moist. There's lots of, it's like swampy. There's lots of water for them. And there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of habitat that they can live in and move in. And so they have the ability to move a lot with little effort. So that's why you see that, um, that really yellow, all those yellow spots in Florida. But even from, I'm just thinking from the mosquitoes perspective, you know, temperature would be really important because it, they're, um, they're cold-blooded organisms, and so they need warm, warm temperatures to move around well. But at the same time, they need water, and heat creates, evaporates water and makes it dry. So in both directions, temperature is important. It can't be too hot, it can't be too cold. Um, and what's really cool about these models that we run, it's called a random forest algorithm, is that it can go either direction and we can encapsulate all of that in this map. So that's a really exciting thing about this method, I think. Okay, so now that we have an idea about what controls this mosquito movement, that temperature is really important, slope, barren land, human density, green space, and then we have some other things that aren't so important. Um, but once we have this concept of what controls movement, let me tell you how we can then use this information and knowledge to make mosquitoes less deadly to us. So one application of um, this information is um, using a Wolbachia, which is a natural bacteria, to stop the spread of disease. Wolbachia bacteria actually block the transmission so it makes the mosquito better able to fight off the virus. So it no longer have, gets the virus as easily and then it doesn't transmit it to the next human. So I just wanted to give you guys a quick, let's see if we can hear this. Oh shoot. The mosquito known as Aedes aegypti originated in Africa. 
Over the last 400 years, it has spread throughout all tropical regions of the world, transmitting viruses to people. We are working on a way to stop this mosquito from transmitting dengue. Our method uses naturally occurring bacteria called Wolbachia that live inside insect cells and are passed from one generation to the next through the insect's eggs. Wolbachia are found naturally in up to 60% of all the different species of insects. Insects that include fruit flies, moths, dragonflies, and butterflies. The secret to the success of Wolbachia is how it manipulates the reproduction of the insects it lives in, so to give itself an advantage. It works like this. If a male insect has Wolbachia and mates with a female that doesn't, then the eggs she lays won't hatch. If the female has Wolbachia and the male doesn't, she would lay her normal number of eggs. They would all hatch, and all offspring will carry Wolbachia. When two insects that both carry Wolbachia mate, the eggs will hatch, and all offspring will carry Wolbachia. Over a few generations, the number of individuals carrying Wolbachia increases rapidly until nearly all the insects within a population have the bacteria. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of background on Wolbachia. And, um, uses natural, our method uses naturally occurring bacteria. There we go. Um, and gives you the sense that Wolbachia can actually spread naturally through a population of mosquitoes which would be a great thing because it prevents the transmission of the dengue virus, which really is threatens about half of the world's population. We actually don't have it here in Utah, which is great. We, this mosquito does live in um, Nevada and it, in the very southern corner of Utah um, because it can't survive the cold winters that we have up here. But a lot of the world is warm enough for this mosquito and has this really big threat of the, uh, the dengue and other viruses like Zika and chikungunya and yellow fever. So if we could spread this Wolbachia and prevent the transmission of disease, that would be a really good thing. So heat maps, such as the one that um, I made with colleagues for this, uh, for this paper that I'm presenting, um, can help us to understand things like where to release these Wolbachia mosquitoes, um, when to release, how many sites. So I want to do just one more quick kind of thought experiment um, and have volunteers tell me what you think. But um, turn to your neighbor or just think to yourself about where on the map might you want to release. If we were going to say, okay, we only have three places we're going to release these Wolbachia, and we're going to really release a lot of them, what would be the best place on this map to release Wolbachia mosquitoes, to spread the Wolbachia as far as you possibly could? Yeah, we have a volunteer. So Florida is probably Mexico. Okay, Florida, oh, because you see some yellow. So what is cueing you into Florida? So generally speaking, I would say that we would want to choose three places on the map that were really bright yellow. Because those are the places that we have a lot of movement of mosquitoes, and so that would allow these Wolbachia to spread more quickly throughout the region. We can also apply the same thinking to the opposite of, okay, if we're going to uh, treat water to prevent mosquitoes from breeding in it, where would we best want to control the mosquitoes um, and prevent movement across these regions that uh, potentially uh, we could clear of mosquitoes or clear of the disease? So it's always, it's a balance and I think that another really interesting and, and important um, thing to think about in the future is how to combine these different ways of controlling the disease. So using Wolbachia releases to prevent the transmission, but also using insecticides to reduce populations in a really smart way so that at the end of the day, we have populations of mosquitoes. Yes, we're never going to get rid of them entirely, but we have smaller populations of mosquitoes that are transmitting less disease. 
So the conclusions are that you know mosquitoes spread these diseases, and science using these different tools that I've talked about, using DNA sequencing and using these satellite images and machine learning algorithms, we can really and and also just simple experiments like Lindy McBride's experiment, um, we can get get these windows into their lives about what are their adaptations, what what um, do they need. Why do they do the things they do? Where do they live? How far and where do they move? And all this information can then be used to design smart and adaptive control programs to reduce the spread of the disease. Not only just kill as many mosquitoes as possible, but smartly use our resources to reduce the transmission and the population sizes of mosquitoes. And I would like to open up to any lingering questions. Thank you, Norman. Questions for Dr. Sarno? Yes. I had a question back on the Lindy McBride experiment. Uh, it seemed that there were a lot more mosquitoes that had been adapted to the ports than the city. And I have been over this with these people, I know, but I couldn't remember. Did they just have a smaller sample size of the? Oh yeah, I think there was an imbalance. There were more forest mosquitoes. So those each of those bars. Repeat the question for people. Oh yes. So the question was, um, why was was there a difference in the number of experimental uh, um, treatments that for the city mosquitoes versus the the forest mosquitoes in the Lindy McBride experiment? And the answer is yes, because each of those bars was a separate experiment. And I'm not sure what the reasoning was, I can't remember. I think it was probably something like they just, they, they had a location in um, Kenya where they had found these populations that were, they were actually like within the same region that were living in the forest and living in the city. Um, and so they had this opportunity to do this, this uh, comparison of really very closely related mosquitoes within the same species that have these two different habits. So it was probably just a, um, a limitation that they only had so many experimental cages of these different lineages. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I, I thought I heard once that there's only a, a pretty small number of species that transmit most of these diseases. Is that true? That's very true. There, so malaria is is transmitted by just several uh, species in the um, Anopheles genus of mosquitoes, and um, and then the vast majority of dengue, yellow fever, Zika are transmitted by the yellow fever mosquito, and then one other, which is called Aedes uh, albopictus, the the Asian tiger mosquito, which is very closely related. So it seems like these viruses really only target specific insects for to do their their transmission, um, and the other the other kind of group would be like the West Nile virus, um, which is around here, and that's usually transmitted sometimes by the Aedes group, but often by the Culex mosquitoes, which is another group of mosquitoes. So there's kind of three big players in the mosquito world, even though there's more than 3,000 species total, there's really only three big players, the groups of mosquitoes that um, play a role in transmission to humans. And a lot of that's just because you have to be fighting humans to transmit to humans. And a lot of mosquitoes just don't really care to fight humans. Yeah. Yeah. So what would be a way to, to transmit that bacteria that you're talking about so people do releases, and it, it's actually um, it's ongoing, and there's building support because for for studies that they've done so far, it really provides a lot of um, of reduction in disease transmission. So it can reduce disease transmission of dengue fever by like eighty percent. So it's almost like vaccinating the mosquitoes in a way. Um, so what they do is they, they bred these in, in colonies, basically. So in cages, they bred mosquitoes 
and they've been able to insert a little tiny needle into their abdomen and actually insert that bacteria, which lives inside the mosquito. It's an endosymbiont. So it lives only within the mosquito and it's transmitted from mother to daughter, or sons actually, mother to kids. So um, it has to spread naturally once you introduce that to the population, but you have to release a ton of them. So you release a bunch of these mosquitoes from cages and then the, the bacteria spread naturally that way. And so some, something that I'm working on and, and thinking about a lot lately is how to leverage the kind of data that I can collect to make really smart plans on how we should release those. Like how far apart do we put the stations where we release mosquitoes? How many stations for how many months for how many years? You know, really crunching the numbers to just figure out the very best way to do that. sort of a bottleneck. So if we're thinking about where should we release mosquitoes, should we really be releasing them in Florida specifically, or should we be releasing them also, or maybe instead in a more central location where they can spread to the rest of the country, for example. Um, and this, so I, I want to first clarify that this is just an example because nobody's releasing these mosquitoes in the U.S. yet. They've been um, authorized to be released in Colombia, in Malaysia, um, I think several different countries, other countries in Asia, um, I'm trying to think, I think Brazil, and no, nowhere in the US yet. Uh, but theoretically, um, I think that you're definitely right, you would have a bottleneck there, and so you'd have to consider that, and you probably would have to do multiple different releases. And a lot of these releases are like at the city scale, so you would be like Miami, for example, and so you'd be thinking about how to re how to release most efficiently within the city, um, and you wouldn't necessarily expect them to move to a different city because that level of movement, the more distant movement, is often through like hitch hitching a ride in a car with a person, or these long distance movements are really rare. Um, and the more common movement is just 100 meters. I think the average, what studies have shown is the average movement is like 75 meters in a lifetime of a mosquito. So it's, it's really tiny in spatial scale. So you have to do separate cities to do it separately. Yeah? Uh, what are some damages? How the bacteria are transported to the That is actually not fully understood. It's, um, it's an interaction of the bacteria with the immune system of the mosquito. Because mosquitoes also have immune systems and they're fighting off all sorts of bacteria and viruses at all times. Um, and so there's some, some mechanism that allows the, it to kind of prime the immune system of the mosquito and make them less susceptible to the virus. It's sort of a quirk of nature. It's really it's interesting. Is the, sorry, the question is, does it get rid of the virus? So you said it, it will affect the immunity of the mosquito. So will it prevent it from getting infected with the virus or will it prevent it, will it allow it to kill the virus? I think, um, you know, I actually don't know if, if anyone knows exactly. Um, how, so the question is whether the mechanism is that when the mosquito has the Wolbachia, is it just blocking, is it not getting the disease, or is it able to kill off the virus? Um, I, I have, uh, I think I've read things that say more on the second one, that it's killing off the virus or not allowing it to get to this level that it would transmit to another human. But I don't know that it's fully understood. It's, it's really, um, we're just finding out about it. Any other questions? Yeah. So I'm just 
Okay, so the question is, uh, since mosquitoes need to bite two different humans to transmit the virus from human to human, can they just bite one and then in, in the same, you know, hour or something bite another person and just transmit the, the virus? And the answer is actually no. So the way that the, the virus gets transmitted is it actually goes into, you know, into their proboscis and into um, their midgut. And then it actually, once it becomes really prevalent in the midgut, it disseminates into the hemolymph, which is like the blood system of the mosquito. And after it becomes like a lot, a lot of a huge viral load in the hemolymph, then it goes into the salivary glands. And then that is how the, the, it has to be in the salivary gland after going through the whole body of the mosquito and get into the salivary gland to be transmitted to another human. So it does have to go, it has to kind of pass through those different barriers in the mosquito. Yeah? Um, have there been any tests done to see if this will rest the type of bacteria would like, be effective in human beings for stopping these diseases or viruses? I couldn't hear, I think I couldn't hear one part of your question. Just the, if, if that bacteria, that type of bacteria would be effective in stopping the viruses in humans. Oh, like if humans were infected with it? Okay, so the question is whether the bacteria could be used directly on humans. And no, because um, the bacteria is, is only creating this effect of blocking the virus by being within the mosquito and interacting with the immune system of the mosquito. And it wouldn't interact with our immune system in the same way. It's evolved to only live within insects. Yes. While we're on this topic, is it possible that it's just out competing the virus for like the cellular like resources and nutrients? Is that really what's going on with Wallachia? Is it just this, like competition? The so question is whether Wallachia work because they're out competing the virus, and I think that that is a component of it. I think the scientists believe that that's a component of what's going on. That they're kind of out competing and using the resources that would otherwise have gone to the virus. That's a part of it, but I think it's a really complex thing that I don't think people quite understand yet. There's, it's hard to do these experiments to really figure out the specific mechanism, but it's kind of in relatively easy to say, hey, we do an experiment where we uh, look at the, infection, the transmission rate in mosquitoes that have Wolbachia versus those that don't have Wolbachia, and we can see this huge drop in transmission of disease. So just that pattern is a lot, says a lot. There's still a lot of work to be done, though. Yeah? So, like, if a different... So has this happened before, like, as the mosquitoes migrated, the uh, different species of mosquito made the different species of mosquito and then they created a new species? Has that actually ever happened? Yes, that has happened. And actually, in this, this type of mosquito that I'm talking about, the mosquito, I, I told you that it moved uh, to the Americas, and then it moved to Europe, and then it moved to Asia. And actually, some of those mosquitoes actually moved back to Africa and are now hybridizing with the original African forest mosquitoes. So that happens, and um, it can lead to bringing in new genetic variation and new adaptations to that population. So it's a really important part of um, of the evolutionary process and how we get a lot of different traits and variation in, in mosquito populations or any kind of you know wild wild population. Good question. Okay. I want to thank Dr. Sarman. Thanks a lot for it. So.